I'd also like to take this moment to thank Andrea and Ronan for what they've done here in this event. So I'm going to use the bully platform of saying here I am on stage to, to actually uh, embarrass them for a moment. Uh, it's not my job to do this, um, but I have to say that they got in touch with me and said, would you like to do this for, with us? And I kind of went, that sounds really cool. And then we talked about it and I went, that sounds kind of amazing. And then I worked with them and that was kind of incredible. Such generous, intelligent people to work with. And then I thought, well, this exhibition's going to be really great. And then I came, it was like, unbelievable. And then the conference was great, you know, until this bit. And now you've got me. Um, but can we give them a round of applause? They've just been fantastic, haven't they? So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to offer you a series of pictures. That's pretty much it, you know, usual type of thing. And I'll talk to some of the things that were inspired me from, from, from the talks. I did have the advantage of having preview of some of the PowerPoints, so that allowed me to have a little think. But as this morning went on, so many issues came up, and I'll refer back to my notebook uh, as, as, as they come as, uh, along with those. So we started off with, uh, with Megan Blakely. And, and she was talking about this, you know, uh, intangible cultural heritage. And it made me really think that, you know, when you're talking about this tangible versus in, intangible heritage, that we're engaging with issues around values and fixity. And that issue of fixity came up a couple of times um, during the event. And that in some ways, what we're dealing with here is also um, a contention between uh, instrumental and intrinsic values or direct and indirect values and in some of the work that I've done where I've looked at modes of cultural value uh, I could look at two examples of that you know the utility value of a bridge it, it has its, its ability to enable you to get from one side of the river to the other or if you like the inheritance bequest value of what many museums are really in, engaged with that, uh, that aspect of what can we pass on to the next generation what can we enable uh, future generations to see of our culture and our, our heritage as it, as, as it is now and I was uh, struck by uh, the examples and the aspects here, which is the, to be reminded that culture is a contested space. It's not something we can just take for granted. The examples from uh, Wales and Ireland were very uh, much uh, speaking to that aspect of when we talk about cultural heritage, well, whose heritage, uh, who gets to own it, who gets to have a role in it. And I think there's some important lessons for uh, museums, archives and libraries there as well, and I'll come back to that later on in the talk. But also there was that sense of being careful what values we encourage through our frameworks, whether those are legal frameworks, cultural frameworks, or the way in which we even just catalogue our collections. And I think Dayor has exp expressed some of, the, some of those issues around the way that we catalogue, the way that we record things, and how that has an effect on, on us. And so there's a whole series of sort of uh, unintended consequences that sort of came out in that uh, really interesting uh, talk by, by, by Megan. And I would recommend you going and grabbing hold of the, uh, the, the, the PowerPoint when you get access to that, because there's more than you could probably see this morning. And then we had scrapbooks from Kerry, and that was lovely, wasn't it? Just, just a really interesting, in-depth look at one example which kind of talks to all other examples around that. And really started to address that issue around uh, orphan works and the costs and the onerous actions around orphan works. I saw one tweet, I apologize for not, not mentioning the Twitter person, who said the real cost here is time, not fees. And, you know, human 
time is one of our main investments here, and so we need to be thinking about how we can uh, invest that uh, uh, carefully. But also with that 72% of orphan material in those 54,000 items, there was that question of, well, what is diligent? At what point can I stop being diligent? Where do I say, okay, I've had enough, <laughs> you know? And certainly when you start looking at, you know, an image taking almost three hours for one image to clear, even if you're looking at the lowest uh, common denominator, the denominator there of 35 minutes uh, to clear f for that, you can see that those are uh, massive investments. And that also with it comes with it uh, uh, an issue there, which is, uh, are we going to be willing to either take the risk, as shown in other, other talks? Will we take the risk and just go for it without doing all of the elements of due diligence? Is this a spectrum? Are there some bits of due diligence we can do and then just stop and say, right, now I'm going to take the risk for that other, other aspect at the other end? And also, are we going to be looking at some of our collections and saying, let's not do this because it's just too hard? And that being uh, a significant issue. I, I, I had a, an example about 10 years ago of a German choreographer who wanted to donate his uh, years and years and years of, of, uh, of um, dance choreography videos that he'd been taking over 30, 40 years. And he had one condition that whoever he donated it to would digitize this collection and make it available. But the rights were intractable. It was almost impossible to, to know who had what rights in any given piece of that activity and so we do have to deal with the fact that in some cases whether it's orphan works whether it's just to do with just not even being able to deal with that question of identification who owns the rights when we look at those risk factors sometimes they're going to be too great for us and that came through uh, from Kerry's talk and then I think was taken up to a certain extent uh, in Victoria's talk and um, and I was very taken by what Victoria Stober was saying in terms of copyright digitization and risk. Um, I think it's correct. Archivists are being pulled in two directions uh, at the same time. Uh, what's pulling in them in those directions uh, could be uh, all sorts of different things. But certainly, uh, this issue about how do we make our collections available to as many people as possible is a big driver for what they're trying to do. And in some respects, if one was to take the sort of view from the high mountain top, you know, I would say that there's a responsibility for as much of our collections to be available to as many people as, as possible. But the wrinkles in that as possible. I think that our collections are about uh, engagement, are about entertainment and enlightenment and education. I do think it is about allowing communities to connect with a past and through reuse, not just through reading, through reuse to generate a new future that they are self-determining from their access to those materials. And that came through from some of the examples that were given. You could see how the, the, the way in which a community might want to engage with uh, materials as diverse as the Churchill Blood Axe, Code Breakers, the Glasgow School of Art, um, that those, those different types of materials talk to different communities in different ways, and they will want to do different things with them. I, I was fortunate enough to work with the Wellcome Trust uh, on Code Breakers in helping them design their evaluation and impact measurement uh, uh, mechanisms. And one of the outcomes of that was we need more metadata. Um, which I think is going to be a theme that will come up again uh, as, as we talk through this. Um, but another thing that they were finding was that the digital uh, archive on a, on a one-for-one -one comparison was being used 200 times more than materials that had been sat in the physical environment. And so they are really opening up uh, availability and access to, to those materials. But when we talk about risk, you're also in an environment where the Wellcome Trust is a very large very well-funded organization that has as part of its remit for being that its research will be open access, that its research will be openly accessible. So they might be willing to take risks that another organization that doesn't have the corporate wealth, if you like, behind it, that doesn't have that vision and mission central to its meaning as an organization in some respects, 
might not be so willing. And so one of the other things we have to deal with is the fact that 98% of the museums, libraries, and archives out there are not open access with their collections. Um, it's at least 90%. I'm going to say it's 98%. I have no figures, but I'm going to just say that. Let's go with that along those lines. Because I think actually the, reason, the real number could be even be 99.5% if we to add them up just as institutions. And it struck me that with the Glasgow School of Art, this, with the pre-1939 being considered low enough risk and okay for them to digitize, that that also speaks to some of the issues in terms of both the orphan works, but in terms of how we view collections and what is going to be available on the internet and what therefore is available for people to see, to engage with, and to, uh, and to access. But also, it was nice to see some actual numbers around takedown and some actual numbers around uh, reputation risk and around you know, the fact that there's very little suing or litigation going on out there in our uh, space. And it reminded me that when I went to, when I did my uh, survey of American art museums in 2004, which is a long time ago, you can see how uh, aged I am in this environment. Um, that uh, I went to speak to folk at the New York Museum of Modern Art, and they said, and I said, uh, uh, what's your attitude to copyright and artists? And uh, Mickey Carpenter at the time said, ah, oh, there's only three types of artists. There's the, there's the living, there's the dead, and there's the good and dead. <laughs> and they liked the good and dead because it allowed them to do more things with their materials. And then when I asked museums like MoMA, like the New York Met, like um, uh, San Francisco MoMA, uh, the National Gallery, et cetera, I said, what do you do when people steal your works? They said, well, we send them an escalating uh, levels of really rude letters telling them to stop. Uh, and I said, will you ever go to court? And they went, no, we will never go to court. Um, and so we're, we're dealing with, if you like, a sort of uh, distorted um, playing field where one side can never go to court and another side could potentially go to court. Um, and, uh, and so that places uh, a series of risky environments that uh, practitioners have to be aware of and be engaged with um, and understand uh, where they sit in that. Now, moving on to Dale um, and Andrea's uh, great talk, which I think actually also, I'd have to say that all of the talks this morning only scratch the surface of the amount of research that is behind those talks. There's a massive amount more to come from all of our speakers this morning in terms of publications and future talks, future pop-up exhibitions, future um, events like this. And I would, I would also say I want to see that stuff. You know, this is the heart blood of academic scholarly uh, engagement is our ability to talk to each other, but it's also to get it written down so that we can cite it and share it in those environments. And I think particularly with, with Andrea's talk, there's, um, uh, there's, there's, there's probably about 20 papers in just that little talk this morning, not, not just one or two. Um, but the aspect of talking about the risk and talking about those elements. Now, I was invited to give a paper I, 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 to this, and I, I talked about um, uh, the black fan and this image. I'm not going to, to, to revise that paper. You've all got access to that um, uh, availability. Um, but, to quote Andrea, it gets pretty meta, uh, was one of the things that she said. And then she said, I get quite obsessed with metadata. And I saw that got retweeted a few times. And then, uh, I hope Caroline Alexander doesn't mind me, but a copy of a copy of a copy with museum metadata as labels, my inner geek is so happy. Yes, we're all really, really happy, Andrea. <laughs> Our inner geek is, is, is celebrating and, um, and, uh, and applauding uh, you and Dale and Ronan for going as meta as you have, because it's been so revealing and so informative uh, around that. Because Dale talks to different levels of risk, it reveals the opacity of licenses, which I think is 
quite an important thing to understand and learn from. So even those as open as open, you know, the SMK in Denmark, the Rice Museum, can be opaque or confusing in their environments. And yet, when you listen to Taco Dibbits, when you listen to my very good friend, Maretta Sanderhoff, uh, they talk about being as open as you possibly can. And I think there's a very important principle there, which is how do you engage a community in an environment of trust where, to a certain extent, the actual wording of the licenses becomes less important to a certain extent? Because the reality is, is the members of the public, the general public, who aren't us, shouldn't have to care about this. They should be able to just know what they can do and have confidence in that. So as Moretta would say, it's important to be seen as open. It's not enough just to be open. It is important to be seen as open and to convey what that means. And I think that both those organizations have done that through the way that they act, the way that the SMK has, has opened up artist hack days, has enabled you know, wearable, um, wearable pieces of art and really worked with their local community to make people aware that it's free, it's open, do things with it, make things uh, around those. Um, and, but there's still, you know, that, that, that slight tension there obviously between the copyright and the image or the metadata and what that means and how it exists. And I, and I talk about this often as, you know, the members of the public want us to be transparent. But there's a way of being transparent which is so transparent it's invisible. And a lot of the time copyright sits in that space. And so, you know, in the same way that we can see a weather system, we can tell whether it's going to be uh, sunny or um, stormy today, we can feel that the air is warm in this room at this moment. You know, we can see, you know, uh, something that's transparent as the air in terms of big, uh, uh, weather movements, but then if I look in my hand, where is it? And when we get to that level of detail, it becomes utterly invisible and, and, and may, you know, when we talk about opaque or transparency, often we actually mean exactly the same thing in terms of how the public's behavior responds to the information that we give them. And so we need to be giving them those big messages. It's important to be seen as open. I think that copy that's going to be really exciting. I hope that uh, 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 goes there. Those interactive graphics would clearly show what cannot and cannot can be done. Um, there is obviously always going to be that issue for all of us when anything that we're doing, which is um, it does rely to a certain extent upon the user uh, caring enough to click, caring enough to hover, caring enough to spend however much time it takes, whether that is one second or, or 50 um, to look at and engage with the materials. And, but I do think that that, uh, that element of uh, something like copy that, some of the things that you heard from Naomi when she was talking about the, um, uh, the tools that are out there to help you uh, manage risk the way in which a lot of these um, presentations provide you with exemplars of, of best practice, the way in which we're starting to see a whole community building standards around open GLAM and open access. Recently, I was at the uh, IIIF uh, conference, which is about image interoperability, so a very low-cost way of sharing uh, images in an open uh, GLAM environment. Um, and also that sense that, you know, we can use standards to our benefit. We can use it as a way of, in the same way that we've got that with the, with the, with the commons, with the copyright commons, with uh, the CC zeros and CCBYs, we can use these um, to our benefit to shorten the distance between what we want to achieve and how we can get there and to reduce the amount of cost that it is for a, it's going to cost us to make those resources available. One thing I would maybe just say at this moment is, and this is something that comes up a lot in my digital humanities um, perspective. So I, I'm from the Department of Digital Humanities at King's College London. 
And that is that we're often having to have the conversation with the people that we're partnering with, whether those are museums, libraries, or archives, or, or other academics, or other subject areas, and reminding them that the data is not the website, and the website is not your data. And that when we talk about openness, sometimes we're talking about the openness of the website. Can you access things on the website? Sometimes what we really need to be talking about is, well, maybe you could just make the data open and let people build their own interfaces to it and let people build their own ways of viewing that. The way that the Walker um, collection was made available and the way that Will Knoll talks about um, these, sorts of, these sorts of activities. And again, standards can be our friend in this environment. But always remember, when you're having that discussion, sometimes the block is because people are talking about the website and the marketing department is saying, oh, yeah, you're not allowed to do anything with the website. The website, no, 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 no. So just make your data available. They're not necessarily the same thing. Keep them in mind that they have some separation there. Because let's have no doubt that you're going to be worrying about money. And money is going to be a driver in decision making, it's going to be a driver in terms of your ability to take action and to do things. And that might, be, that might be money in the form of people, it might be money in the form of infrastructure costs, it might be money in terms of your director saying, I don't want to give up those license fees that we get from certain types of, of, of uses. And undoubtedly, you know, this sort of conversation is an important one to have. So uh, I was recently involved with conversations with a major museum who has uh, made most of their material available with a CCBY uh, um, uh, license. And they're having that internal conversation, could we go CC0? Could we go the full Europeana, shall we say, um, along those lines? And they're having to have that conversation about, well, what would happen to our commercial revenue? And what would that mean to our commercial revenue? But then on the other hand, the other part of that commu communication is, do you know how much time we, spent nego we spend negotiating licenses with a commercial provider who is going to put a mug in our shop? And actually, the amount of time and effort we put into negotiating those commercial licenses is getting, away, getting in the way of that supplier putting a mug in our shop. And where do we actually make money from this transaction? We don't make it from that license sale. We make it from the mug being sold in the shop. So when you look at where are the major places of revenue for museums in particular, it's exhibitions, it's uh, the shop, it's the restaurant. One could even say that you know, the perfect uh, visitor to the museum is one who will come in, buy your exhibition ticket, sprint through the exhibition, uh, wander into your shop, spend all their money in the shop, then go to, go, to, go to the cafe and then leave so that other people who are actually interested in the art can enjoy it in peace <laughs> around that. That was actually said to me by a museum director who wanted me to get the point that obviously that sort of cynicism is a very dangerous thing. But it also means that we have to remember that images are often the Cinderella service or the Cinderella part of the museum, essential to that exhibition, essential to that exhibition catalogue, essential to the brand of that, of that museum and organisation, essential to those ability to make tea towels and mugs and t-shirts, but often not actually appreciated at, for those roles and those activities. And as I would say, it's a little bit like a car manufacturer only valuing its showroom and saying the only thing that matters is the showroom, because that's the only place we get any money. But actually, without the factory, without the materials, there is no showroom. There is nothing to sell in uh, that activity. There is no public engagement without images in some ways. Um, because you need something which can actually be reused, repurposed, worked with, 
around that. So we need to think about what are the opportunities that we're gaining, and are those opportunities, when we think about that risk-cost-benefit circle or triangle that, that Naomi was talking about, how do we mount up the benefits so that they become worth it for us to make this move? Now, for some people, it may not happen, but for others, I would contend that, you know, if we can get it from 98% not doing it to 80% not doing it, I think that would be a really great thing. And it would be amazing for, uh, for our public uh, engagement with these materials. So I've been chair of the Impact Task Force for, for Europeana for a few years. We've been building uh, impact measures. How do we show those benefits? And I think this is the thing that needs to go alongside any investment in making your content available, is finding out if it's available, what would that mean to people, and how would that be used, and why is that going to be of benefit to them? And we kind of look at this from three different uh, perspectives. So if you like, uh, an economic uh, perspective of uh, improved welfare, a social and cultural perspective of deeper understanding, and an innovative and influential network. Um, could we do things that we previously would not have been able to do if we hadn't had this material available in digital form or available with a CC0 license? And so you can see that moving from activity through to uh, outcomes and impacts. You know, having a content reuse framework leads to standardization, which leads to connectivity and interoperability, which leads to our ability to then measure innovation and influence within the network. So I think these elements are important as well alongside those. But I'd like to finish off um, by talking about dead white European men. Um, I know this is slightly ironic with me being a white European male, but I'm not dead yet. <laughs> Um, and hopefully I can, uh, I, I can speak to this a little bit. And again, it comes back to some of those issues around if you're not digitizing material because it's not in the public domain, if you're stopping uh, looking at 20th century materials because they look too dangerous to digitize, too risky to digitize, what does that mean? Well, it kind of has two spaces, really. It kind of has an element here, which is that if you're a digital humanities person and you want to use digital content to build digital tools to do new types of research inquiry, and all you've got is material that predates 1900, then that's going to skew, to a certain extent, which types of scholars can engage in that type of investigation. It's going to skew the scholarly output as well in terms of what things have been studied in that kind of depth. So there is that aspect of it in terms of uh, uh, those elements. But there's also the aspect that was drawn up very much by Alistair McCleary in terms of, well, what if all we're doing is we're digitizing the things that dead white European males were interested in? Because if you like, somewhat, some people would say that that's exactly what those museum, library, and archive collections represent. They represent the views of Europeans who were generally male, who were generally white, who said this is what is worth collecting. And in a strange way, that was one of the challenges for Dale. It was really hard uh, for Andrea to find works of art that were in the public domain that didn't actually, in many ways, just replicate this dead white European male uh, concept. And that has consequences. Because if the only things that are available online are re-emphasizing an imperial past, a colonial past, how does this allow communities to build their sense of being and their sense of engagement in this environment. And so when we talk about copyright, there's that element of consequences and the element of what does this mean for certain communities. And so I would just end by saying, you know, we, one of the things I hate most is when people say the justification for digitizing my collection is because it was democratized access. More people seeing it is not the same as democratizing access. This is a contested space. I and many of my colleagues work with 
many um, collections in Africa, in, I've worked with collections in New Zealand and Australia with indigenous peoples. I've worked with uh, collections in many areas of the world where the idea of having this sort of conference is a luxury. And they're in the process of trying to be heard. It's not even a matter of how can we actually uh, have something to say. It's a matter of, you know, struggling, as I say, struggling to be, struggling to belong, struggling to build an identity, whether that is a local, cultural, or national identity, to be recognized, to be believed, to be understood, to understand, and to be heard. And so we also need to think about the consequences of the law and the legal frameworks, going back to those first talks, first three talks this morning, where they all identified that the framework in which we work, the way in which that work is done, creates as much as reflects our culture. And so that's why we called this bringing the threads together of cultural discourse and uh, culture uh, in this talk. Thank you very much.